Okay. Um, so again, welcome. And my name is Anita Nickerson. I'm Fairvote Canada's Action Coordinator, which just means I help, um, you know, coordinate at national actions. And mainly what I do is a lot of supporting our amazing volunteers, which are like 99.99% of Fairvote Canada is people like you making this happen. And today we have a special guest with us who is going to answer most of the questions because by the end of the time I get to the end of the presentation, you'll all be really tired of listening to me, trust me. So this is uh, Tony Hodgkin. He is president of Fair Voting BC. And as you can imagine, he's been super, super busy with a referendum coming up in BC um, less than a year from now. So I'm going to go through a presentation. It's about 35 minutes. I'm because I'm not great at cutting things out. I'm going to talk really fast and then we will have as long as people want to answer questions. So as I'm talking, um, you can be writing questions in your question or chat box. Um, okay, hold on. It says, I just want to click this button that says start broadcast. Okay. Okay. All right, so I don't know if that actually made any difference because it seemed like everybody could see and hear me before. But anyway, uh, we clicked another button here. So when I'm done the presentation, then I'm, we're going to read out as many questions as we can and Tony and I will answer them. Okay, so Tony, I'll wave goodbye to you just for now. Okay, and I'm going to this little guy out of my way. All right. Okay, so these are some of the things I'm going to be talking about today, and these are just the most common myths around proportional representation. So there are more, and probably each one of these could be its own webinar. So I'm going to zip through them, and then we will get to questions. So the first thing to note is that uh, when we say things about proportional representation, there's a lot to go on. Because over 80 countries use PR and because almost all of our peers use PR, there is a wealth of not only real world experience to draw upon, but decades and decades of research. So it's not like this is something new and radical. Most of our peers have had PR for 50 to 100 years. So there's some very concrete data uh, to look at. The other thing to understand is that, you know, a myth comes from a story, right? And sometimes a story um, that gets passed down and passed down has an element of truth in it. So it's, I mean, sometimes opponents make things up out of the blue sky, you know, like when we get PR, we'll all grow horns and fly away. But other times it's because, you know, maybe there is a country out there that has the kind of problems that they're talking about. So what opponents tend to do is cherry pick some kind of problematic example that usually has more to do with the political culture of that country than it has to do with their electoral system and they like to create a story around that. So, I mean, we, we on the yes side could do that too, but we choose not to. Okay, we choose to try to look at the whole body of evidence. The other thing that it's very important to remember is that the systems for Canada are rather unique um, in the fact that they maintain local representation. So they're not the, the most common kind of proportional systems in the world. So when opponents are talking about things, sometimes they're talking about problems that would only apply to a model that's a straw man, that's not con ever been considered for Canada, that's not on the table for Canada. So it's important to look at that context too. Okay, um, so the first one I'm going to touch on is stability. And before I do that, I just want to go in and make sure that when I click the last little button, everything worked. It did. Okay. Um, so, and to the person who said, hopefully Tony will be talking, yes, he will. It's just that Tony is extremely busy. Um, so I agreed to put the presentation together and he's going to answer most of the questions. Okay. So uh, the general way to look at stability, when people say PR will cause instability, um, usually that's kind of vague. It's like kind of a scary thing. Like everything will get unstable. Uh, usually what they mean is that we'll be running to the polls 
every one or two years, basically, because no party, single party, can get a majority. The parties will not be able to work together. There'll be lots of posturing, and that means that we'll be having frequent elections. And that's, there's actually really almost no basis for that. So Professor Dennis Pilon did a study of countries over 50 years. And here you can see that the countries with proportional systems had an average of uh, 16 elections, and the countries with winner-take-all systems had an average of 16.7 elections. So there's really no difference in the term of, terms of frequency of elections between proportional and winner-take-all countries. And that's because the incentives change. So it kind of goes against common sense when you've been raised in a first-past-the-post system. Because in a first-past-the-post system, when you uh, when one party doesn't get a majority, you end up with a minority government. And when you end up with a minority government, what each of the parties wants is to build to form their own majority government and not have to work with anybody else. Therefore, the incentive very much is to call an early election as soon as the polls start to swing in their direction. Uh, but in proportional systems, those incentives are turned on their head. So now the incentive uh, is to show that you can cooperate with other parties, to show that you can work together and get things done so that the electorate will re re reward your party with more seats next time. But everybody knows that nobody's going to be running the show on their own. So that, uh, that gold ring is basically missing. Another way, um, before I go on to explosion of parties, the other way to look at stability is in terms of stability of policies. And I didn't have a really good graphic for this, unfortunately, but one of the problems with winner-take-all systems is something that we call policy lurch. And policy lurch just refers to the idea that when one party is elected with, say, 39% of the vote and they bring in all these policies, if a party of a different philosophy is elected with 39% of the vote, they spend the first one to two years basically undoing all the policies that the first government brought in. And then we flip back and forth, which is uh, one of the reasons you might look at when you ask why are countries with proportional representation making incremental progress on some major challenging issues whereas the majoritarian countries aren't doing so well and policy lurch partially explains this because it's very inefficient to keep starting and restart uh, starting things and canceling them starting them again and canceling them and back and forth we go you know so we can look at this right now in terms of climate right we've signed on to the paris climate uh, accord, who knows how much progress we'll make, but if there's a conservative majority government elected in 2019, what do you think is going to happen to anything that was agreed, right? So the next thing to look at is explosion of parties. And usually what people are talking about is just this fear-mongering situation where they create an image of all these uh, small fringe uh, loony parties, you know, anybody that has a party that wants to protect the zoos or whatever, there'll be like, you know, 30 parties in the house and it'll just be chaos. So in reality, this doesn't happen and I'm going to give you a few different reasons why it doesn't happen. Um, so first of all, uh, first of all, the models for Canada. So I started off mentioning that you have to put everything in the context of models for Canada. So with a mixed member system, if we had, and it's going to get a little geeky here, we had a 12-member region, okay? So a region that included 12 seats, all right? And let's say eight or nine of them were local seats and maybe five of them were list seats. You would need, uh, like 12% of the vote would guarantee you uh, a regional list seat. So 12% is pretty high. Uh, you don't just, parties just don't come out of the woodwork with, 12% support. And if you look at the other major model for Canada, uh, single transferable vote, if you have a five seat district, then a candidate would be guaranteed a seat with 16.7%. Now in either of these models you could win a seat with lower, but those are the, those are the thresholds that guarantee you a seat in, the, in that configuration of that model. Okay, so we're not talking about a situation where anybody with 2 or 3 percent is going to be awarded a seat. The other thing to look at is just what we call fringe parties, and I, I don't mean to be condescending, I'm just talking about, you know, the 
parties that run in your riding that get 100 or 200 votes kind of thing uh, that don't even come close to 1%. So somebody did a study and looking at the last three federal elections and they found that all 15 to 20 of these fringe parties put together didn't get 1% of the vote. So we're a long way from seeing uh, a situation where on in any aspect where there's going to be uh, an explosion of small or fringe parties in Canada's parliament. It's also important to kind of question the whole story. The whole story goes that we get proportional representation and then it leads to all these parties. Um, but actually it's more often the other way. When a country switches to proportional representation, it's because they've already become a multi-party system. So it's kind of like a trying to fit, you know, five or six parties into a system that was poorly designed for two parties. And what often happens is that when the first past the post system stops working for one of the big parties, as it did for the Liberals in 2011, they ended up with 34 seats. Suddenly, um, you know, vote splitting, and suddenly they were very interested in proportional system because they could see that the first past the post system really wasn't working in this multi party context, which we've had in Canada since about 1921. So to give you some concrete examples uh, of how many parties actually exist in countries with proportional representation that are something like Canada. Um, so you can see right now in Germany they have six parties in their legislature and uh, in the last, before the last election recently there was four. Okay, New Zealand now has six, previously there was eight. So you can kind of see the range of number of parties that kind of bounce around in these systems that have PRSTV or have mixed member proportional. And here you can see that the UK with first past the post uh, has quite a few parties there. So is it true that proportional representation is associated with more parties? Yes, but marginally more parties, not in a huge explosion of parties. Okay, so the other thing to look at, and this is just kind of an extension of what I was talking about before with the small parties, is does the tail wag the dog? And we're seeing a lot of these kind of claims right now in British Columbia with our the BC PR referendum coming up. So the story here is that there will be a big party and a really small party and the small party will have all kinds of demands that nobody else agrees with and the big party will just give in to all these demands so they're basic, basically the tail will wag the dog. Okay, but in reality this is not what happens. I mean I can understand why this is a scary story but it just you know, it's about as real as Hansel and Gretel. So in the last election in New Zealand, um, there was a lot of this talk going on. Even though New Zealand has had mixed member proportional for over 20 years now, because they have a long history of first past the post and they have a good number of uh, PR opponents still in New Zealand, you know, who lament, you know, that proportional representation came to New Zealand. So. Uh, when the coalition negotiations in New Zealand took a couple of weeks this time and there was a smaller party involved, there was all kinds of stuff in their media about the, is the tail wagging the dog and the small party has so much power. And in the end, one of the commentators at the end of it uh, put this great article out saying the tail did not wag the dog, it barely wiggled. And what he's saying is that if a small party is a set of policy initiatives, those are not going to be adopted by the large party in coalition with them unless it's something that the large party agrees with, unless it's something that a good percentage of the population agrees with. They, the things that get adopted are generally things that the two parties have in common. So in reality, small parties in coalitions have small power. That's almost universally the experience. I mean, and that's why small parties wrestle with, do we want to go into coalition or not? You know, in coalition, we'll have ministers in the government, but we won't be able to really criticize the government that we're part of when they're doing things that we maybe don't agree with. So maybe we would rather be outside in the opposition. It's because they don't have a lot of power that they have those kind of conversations. 
big parties who give in to demands by very small parties that are not supported by most of the public will pay the price at the next election. So another interesting thing to look at is that research shows that the share of vote going to quote unquote extremist parties is not related to the electoral system. So it doesn't mean that small parties with maybe more extreme views aren't more likely to get a couple of seats. Possibly, yes. But in terms of how many people are actually voting for those parties, just because you introduce a proportional system doesn't make more people want to vote for those points of view. It just doesn't. Um, the other thing to look at is in practice, often the case is that other parties won't even work with the extremist party. So Contrary to the stories that were being told where the small party gets into the government and basically runs the whole province, the reality is more like uh, three or four other parties get together and say, you're not going to be in the government, sorry. <laughs> and I think this is one of the reasons sometimes these smaller parties don't grow that much because their voters start to see that you're getting representation but you're not necessarily getting any power or any influence. And we saw this in Sweden, we saw this in Germany, um, we saw this even in the Netherlands, where other parties uh, will work together and deliberately make sure that that smaller party whose views are not shared by most people are not part of the governing coalition. To turn this on its head, the, when you look at extremist views, so if you look um, in the Netherlands, if you look in Germany, and you look in Sweden, these kind of um, anti-immigration, far-right kind of parties that people are afraid of are picking up about 12 or 13 percent of the vote. We can't pretend that those points of view don't exist in Canada because they do. We can't, all you have to do is look south and see what a good job First Past the Post is doing at protecting us from uh, extremist views having power. Okay, in reality, proportional representation would probably protect us better from those views having power because right now, um, those kind of extreme views exist within the big tent parties where they're putting forth policies like the barbaric cultural practices hotline. Okay, like when health emergency life saving health care was cut off to refugees in the last government, which was then overturned by the court. So those views are actually having quite a bit of influence within the big tent where we can't always see them as clearly. With PR, sometimes it's a little easier to see them and make the parties take ownership. Okay, so I think I pretty much covered this. It's only a first past the post system that's going to allow a leader who is supported by 25% of eligible voters to have 100% of the power. That would never happen in a proportional system. It's just impossible. Okay, I want to go on as well to appointed or accountable MPs. So now we're getting a little bit more technical here. And what we're talking about is the myth that we hear that somehow when you have proportional representation, you're going to uh, lose your local representatives and they will be replaced by um, nameless party hacks who get a free ride into the legislature on the party list and are only accountable to the party. So that's the fear, right? And when uh, New Zealand had its referendum on mixed member proportional, the opponents were putting out ads showing people with bags over their heads to represent this kind of myth. So this is really easily dispelled, but it's not always easily dispelled in a 10 second soundbite that you can explain on the CBC News. It's easily, uh, it's a myth that's easily dealt with by anybody who takes five minutes to look at what's actually on the table. So with a mixed member system, you would have what we call open lists in Canada because I have not seen any appetite for a closed list system where you just vote for a party in Canada. There's no party, there's no group, there's just nobody that's proposing it. So it's very much a kind of a straw man argument at this point. So open lists mean that all MPs face the voters and it means that voters choose the candidates, both the local candidates and the regional candidates. 
and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so I hope everybody can kind of see this. This is um, this is a mixed member proportional ballot, and I tried not to make a dummy ballot. You know, it, this is pretty realistic. What you're looking at on the top is your first past the post vote for your local MP, just like you have now. What you're looking at in the bottom is an open list, uh, open party lists for regional candidates. So you pick your uh, local MP at the top. You may or may not elect somebody just like today. And then you mark one X under one party at the bottom. That's it. So if you want to vote uh, NDP, say NDP's party A, you like Joe from the NDP, you just put an X by Joe's name and you go home. That's it. It's one X under one party. And that, uh, that tells uh, Elections Canada what percentage of the seats in that region that party should have. And then those regional seats are filled by the most popular candidates, the candidates directly elected by the voters, no appointed MPs. The other main option for Canada is a multi-member system like single transferable vote. And if you can think of voting systems on a continuum, so imagine you've got a continuum and on one end here you have closed list systems party-centered systems where voters don't have very much choice. It's choose a party, that's it. And then on the far end of the, uh, the continuum, you have candidate-centered systems that give voters the maximum amount of choice and they're not about parties, they're all about candidates. Okay, so it's on a, it's, you know, you might look at an open list MMP system somewhere in the middle. Single transferable vote is on the far end. Okay, so it's a candidate-centered system, even though it does deliver proportional results for parties. So again, it's the opposite of party hacks. This is an example of a ballot for single transferable vote that you might see in a district electing four MPs or MLAs. And what you would do here is write uh, one, two, three, anywhere you want, any order that you want, as few or as many as you want. So I can choose one for my, uh, you know, oh, I like, uh, I like party B, candidate B, and I like party A, candidate C, and then maybe I'll rank that independent third. And, you know, you can rank one, two, or you can rank the whole ballot. It doesn't matter. You can choose whatever you want to do, and, it's, and the most popular candidates in that, in that district get elected. So it's kind of the opposite of what the, what the myth is about PR. The other way to look at it is just to flip it on its head. When opponents say, um, you know, your MP won't be accountable anymore, which as we've shown when they're directly elected, how are they not accountable? The MPs we have today with first past the post, how accountable are they? How accountable are they when 52% of voters in Canada elect nobody? If your MP is sitting in a safe seat and you can't elect them, you can't unelect them, your vote does nothing, how are they accountable? Proportional representation uh, makes sure that you will have an MP or an MLA who is directly accountable because you helped elect them. Okay, so one that we've added to this presentation recently because it's coming up a lot in British Columbia is this idea of how does proportional representation affect rural voters? We're seeing a lot of fear mongering around this PR and rural voters issue. So last week on Twitter um, and addressing other liberal, uh, liberal party members, BC Liberal Diane Watts said that defeating PR is her number one priority and she's hell-bent on defeating it. That's a pretty strong word, eh? She hasn't even seen what models there might be, but she's hell-bent on defeating any of them. It doesn't matter what they are to her, okay? And so far what we've seen, unfortunately, from the BC Liberal Party is that that's a pretty unified position. And the main talking point that they're using right now in the media and all in all the small media around BC, particularly, is that PR will hurt rural voters. So uh, we'll, we're hearing stuff like vote, uh, MLAs in the north will lose their voice. You know, their their voice will somehow go to Vancouver. Uh, they'll or they're all even they'll actually all move down there. 
So this is a little graphic that I did of the northern region of BC, and you can see there with proportional representation and with first past the post, there is the same number of MLAs. Okay, that's because pretty much any model of PR is going to make sure that the northern region remains the northern region with those that same number of MLAs in it. Now, how they're configured and elected will be fairer. Okay, so one party won't be able to sweep one entire region and win every single seat, but the north and all the regions of BC will still have just as strong a voice. And credit to uh, Tony at Fair Voting BC for this making the same point. And here, uh, a couple few weeks ago, we had the Liberal MLA from Cam Loops uh, saying that almost half the seats in the interior of BC would like disappear. But when you look at models of proportional representation, it's more or less that the seats won't disappear. They'll just be distributed more fairly according to how people actually voted. So it won't be possible for the BC Liberal Party to win every single seat in the region of Caribou Thompson on 50% of the vote like they have right now. And it won't be possible for the NDP to pick up almost all the seats in Victoria. There's about 25% of voters in Greater Victoria that vote BC Liberal and they have no representation. So what PR does is it stops one party from being able to sweep every single seat. It doesn't move the seats somewhere else. So PR is actually going to make every region's voice in the legislature stronger. And the way it does that is that now every single region is going to have MLAs or MPPs, but I'm going to use British Columbia right now, MLAs in the legislature who are part of the government and the opposition. Okay, so right now if you are in a region where one party has every single seat in that region and that party is not in the government, all your MLAs or your MPs are in the opposition. And sometimes we see the opposite, right, where the party that's the government has every single seat. And when the checks start to be getting cut before election time and the ribbon cutting and the photos and all this kind of stuff, guess where all the money goes? It goes to the uh, the seats that are of most, of most interest to the governing party and the ones that are safe seats for the opposition, I, the, you don't see the funding going there. So a proportional representation will make sure that parties have to pay attention to every voter in every region. Okay, last one, paralysis or progress. So the other myth we hear about proportional representation is that um, because parties have to work together, nothing will get done. The, so, you know, we need a strong, stable, decisive government to tackle hard times and get things done for the province or whatever. I'm sure you've all heard it. Okay, so I'm going to deal with this idea, does PR cause paralysis or does it cause progress? So first off, how do, how do parties work together? So first thing to understand is it's about how decisions are made, okay? So when people say there's more important issues than electoral reform, you know, when politicians knock on the door and they don't hear proportional representation as one of the top five issues, um, it doesn't mean it's any less important because there's no issue that you can name that isn't affected by how decisions are made. So first past the post, what it does is it concentrates power. And this is something that really um, turns a lot of voters off, quite frankly. I mean, you can see here federally how we voted, how that transferred all the power to one party, which eventually transferred all the power to one person and a bunch of nameless party hacks in the prime minister's office um, or well-known party hacks in the prime minister's office who basically get to sit around and make all the decisions. So how, what PR does is it kind of uh, blasts that pyramid apart a little bit. So among most of our peers, these cooperative governments that the big parties are sometimes so afraid of, uh, anything about that, are actually the norm. So if you look around the world, this is looking at 30 OECD countries, and we see that uh, 
the ones with single party majority governments are 13%, you know, and are mainly talking about, you know, Canada, uh, this Canada, possibly France right now, you know, a couple of countries, that's it. Okay, cooperative governments are the norm and majority coalitions are actually the norm. And this can look different in different countries. So while majority coalitions are the most common kind of cooperative government among our peers, uh, countries like New Zealand who have a long history with first past the post are more likely to have supply and confidence agreements where you have uh, one party who's in a less formal arrangement with another party to, uh, to support their government, but they don't, actually, uh, they don't actually always help run the government. Okay, there's many different kinds of arrangements that you can have is what I'm saying. So I thought this was, this was pretty cool. Now I'm not going to be able to read this because my little control panel is covering it. But this was, uh, this was written into a coalition agreement. And most coalition agreements are written agreements now. They're not like let's just get together and govern because we like each other and we'll just see what happens. It's not like that. It's almost always detailed written agreements that can take a few days to a few weeks to get on paper and that lays out a framework for what the cooperating parties are going to are agree on and are going to do and that provides everybody with transparency and a sense of security so in this particular agreement these parties wrote right into the agreement that uh, that government is not about having power it's about using power together to make a better society and here closer to home we can see this happening right now in BC where the Greens and the NDP have a confidence and supply agreement and uh, this was a little note that Green leader Andrew Weaver sent to John Horgan for, to read at his NDP convention and that was reciprocated a few months ago between the two of them. And you can see they're talking about common ground, about working together on areas that they agree. They're not talking about the Green Party has wild ideas that they're going to force the NDP to do. They're talking about uh, moving together in areas where they can negotiate and agree. So research really shows that decisions are better when they're made with diversity and where there are dissenting voices. It really prevents kind of partisan groupthink. And what do we have for results? Well, this, you know, is a very long topic, but I'm on the last few slides, so I'll be glad to know. Um, the results kind of speak for themselves with proportional representation, and this is the key research that we always point to, and it was done by a man named Aaron Leiphart, who spent his entire career researching this. And if you Google Aaron Leiphart, you'll get reams of stuff, and it's because his, um, his research was foundational, and there, it spawned decades of kind of further research and responses to him and this kind of thing. And he's done two editions of this book where he looks at 36 countries over two 25-year periods, and he found that on almost every single measure, uh, you know, related to the quality of democracy, related to taking care of citizens, any, anything he looked at, countries with proportional systems did better. So for example, um, they have lower income inequality. So many people feel that income inequality is one of those defining issues of our time where we really need multi-party cooperation. And we find that multi-party cooperation is allowing those countries to make uh, progress uh, more sustainably and faster than Canada. Same with environmental performance. Countries with PR are better able to control their carbon emissions, they're, um, they're more innovative, they're able to introduce renewable energy faster, and they're able to get public buy-in for the kinds of changes that we have a hard time getting public buy-in in Canada for here, because winner-take-all systems encourage the parties to pander to the public with things like, I'm going to cut your gas taxes, okay? Whereas in proportional countries, people, uh, the media is filled with more I would say a richer policy debate where people are more aware of all the different views and the different options. Okay, and you can see some of the other really good effects, higher turnout, higher voter turnout, more satisfied voters, more women elected, and many, many other things in the research behind proportional representation. 
So when you look at making votes count, because that's what this is really all about, it's about making almost every vote count. You can see that there's nothing to fear from Canada going the way of most of our peers and making sure that all of us have a voice and almost all of us are able to elect a representative. And this is the last slide that I've put up and this is just uh, reiterating some of the benefits of proportional systems. We can vote for what we believe in and we can see our vote count. Every regional of MLAs or MPPs in the government uh, will have fair results, no more 39% majorities, higher quality decision making. Okay. All right, so I'm going to ask Tony to come back on now and I'm going to open up the questions and take as many questions as we possibly can. So give me a second here. All righty. Hi, Megan. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, just getting down to I think past there, the... There's three or more or five at the bottom of the question block if we want to start there. Yes. Okay, here we go. Um, why is the government fighting this on the basis that it is not stable then? This is not naive on my part. It would be easier for them to get another large majority uh, without PR, but why are they denying the public PR on the basis if it's not factual? <laughs> yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a great question. I guess it also ties in with uh, Catherine's question about, um, uh, in, she says, given the falseness of the prevalent myths against PR, uh, why, what do you think motivates parties like the Liberals to str so strongly oppose PR? And I mean, I think, <laughs> I think ignorance is, you know, one possible explanation, but when you see it uh, adopted as the party line across all the leadership candidates, I think you have to see a, a lot more intentionality there uh, than mere ignorance. I think if people were sincerely ignorant, um, somebody would have spoken to them. <laughs> they would have, uh, they would have listened to what has been said. So I, I think you have to see this as an intentional um, campaigning strategy. They're they're sending out misinformation, and you should ask the question: What's motivating them to do this? And clearly, it's naked self-interest. Um, and we saw that fairly recently. I think Diane Watts explicitly said. Um, this is a this is a defining moment for our party. If PR goes through, we'll never again have a majority government. Basically, recognizing that they don't have majority support at the moment, um, it's actually a kind of strange perspective because there have been a number of times in the past when the right wing has uh, the right and the center right um, has had true majorities in BC. Uh, Gordon Campbell had fifty seven percent of the vote in two thousand and one. Um, so, uh, I, I think it is, uh, it, it, but they do struggle with that and they recognize by and large that they, that moving to PR will mean that they will have to appeal more broadly than they do right now. They're very concerned about their ability to do so. Uh, and they recognize that if you look at the other parties in particular right now, the, the Greens and the NDP who between them uh, garnered 57% vote share, they realize that they're going to have much more competitive elections in the future, and they would prefer that that not happen. And so I think um, people really do see it as a survival issue. Also, if you, if you think about uh, the motivations of the existing MLAs, uh, Anita has spoken about the, uh, the regionalization of our vote, that, uh, that we see that um, liberal MLAs tend to win outside Metro Vancouver, um, and NDP MLAs tend to win on Vancouver Island and, and around Metro Vancouver. I think for a lot of the Liberal MLAs, they recognize that in shifting to another voting system um, in each region, that means that there are going to be MLAs from other parties being elected there. And that means that some of the incumbents are not going to retain their seats. Now, of course, on a party basis, they're going to pick up seats in places that they don't currently have them. There will be liberal MLAs in, around Victoria, the Mid-Island and Vancouver Island, there'll be uh, a fair number more around uh, Vancouver and, and the near suburbs. Um, so 
for the party as a whole, it, it ought to be a net win. But for individual MLAs who are the ones who have the most public visibility, uh, a number of them will have their jobs on the line. And, and I think we do have to recognize this as a reality. It is part of what's driving um, their resistance. And so I think there, one of the things to consider when we consider which voting systems um, might be more widely accepted, particularly by sitting politicians, is whether a particular proposal will allow all incumbents to run again, or are they actually going to lose at the nomination stage? And so different voting systems will differ um, on that criterion. Yeah. I think the other interesting point um, in BC is that when I was doing, making a poster of BC phony majority governments, and that's almost all BC has ever had is false majority governments, like rare exceptions. In most of those cases, the right wing parties were actually a genuine majority. So it was kind of interesting, you know, there was like, there would be one right wing party that would get 40% of the vote and they would be able to govern on their own because they got most of the seats. But if they hadn't needed to, there was another right wing partner that they could have partnered up with and had a right wing coalition government, which we see in much of Europe right now. So when you're looking at the BC Liberal Party, it's not that right wing views it's not that the NDP and Greens are going to be in power forever and the, and the right is going to be shut out. That's just not true. It's that the BC Liberal Party won't be able to govern on its own as often. That's the distinction, right? Yeah. Um, and and that's more about them than about us. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, what will happen is they will face a different set of electoral incentives. And that means that they will have to uh, think about how they approach different policy issues. Uh, they'll have to, um, if they had more uh, uh, candidates who can realistically expect to be elected in Metro Vancouver, they would have actually internally thought a lot more about urban issues in this last election, and that was one, one of the problems. But they will have to shift their policy positions as well, and uh, uh, perhaps to reach accommodation with as you say, other right-wing parties, but even uh, other centrist parties. So historically, BC has not always had this kind of uneasy uh, right coalition between the sort of the liberals and conservatives. Sometimes it's it's had a much more frankly centrist liberal party and and a much more right-wing conservative party. So um, I think it really enables a lot of people to be much more true to their own political philosophies, but then starting from there, try to build a real consensus around, uh, around policy. All right. And I see a question about um, the tail wagging the dog addressing the exception of Israel. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. So of course, you know, the, the two eyes, Israel and Italy, <laughs> they always come up. Um, and I do think uh, as reform supporters, we need to be prepared to talk about this. I think really, though, from a, uh, from a public communications point of view, we really want to turn the conversation elsewhere, not because we want to avoid uh, talking about them, but because we should recognize that those kind of critiques are almost always um, attacks rather than uh, somebody sincerely interested in trying to figure out what's going on here. Um, if, if you are sincerely interested, and I believe that most people on the call are, then uh, I think you, you look at Israel and Italy and you say, look, what's going on there is that they have um, highly fractured societies in a variety of ways. I mean, they, they're, they're different. The, you know, the, um, the history of communists and fascists and um, organized crime in Italy is, uh, is a completely different thing than uh, what's going on in Israel. Um, but by and large, they have uh, both used voting systems that have allowed uh, very small parties to emerge, and so the, the complexity of the potential coalition relationships is very high. Uh, you, you have to, and actually that's one of the issues that has come up in um, a place like Belgium, which uh, people like Bill Thielman will also throw out, you know, why did it take a year and a half to, or however long it took to, uh, to form a government after an election. But I think the, the core answer is uh, we're, <laughs> Any model that we're proposing for use in BC is going to be 
more of the moderate strain. I mean, if, if for no other reason than that we've only got 80 odd seats in our legislature and uh, some of these other places have two and 300. And so there's just a lot more potential for fractionation in these places. If we add on the idea that uh, what we're what we're doing in BC is likely to have a, a system that is more regional in nature. I mean, they're really, um, you know, there's the lower mainland, which is, um, you know, 50 odd seats, uh, the interior, which is 24, if I remember correctly, and, and Vancouver Island, which is about 14. You simply can't have micro parties uh, with that small a number of seats. And so anybody who gets elected is already going to be representing five and 10 and 15% of voters. And we're simply not going to have the number of parties that uh, there are in these places where there's more complexity. And even so, if you look at the number of elections, actual elections in Italy, uh, they're on the low end of the spectrum. So what has tended to happen is that a particular cabinet arrangement has, you know, blown up in some way. And so without another election, what happens is the, uh, the, the, the person who's currently, um, uh, the leader of the biggest party simply goes and finds another coalition partner. And so you start with another cabinet, but it doesn't mean everything blows up. So uh, I think maybe that's, I hope that addresses most of those issues. I think, you know, as Dennis Pilon says, so, um, the instability, yeah, Tony's saying it doesn't necessarily mean a new election. It's what we would call a cabinet shuffle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, you know, if there's, you know, if partway through a governing coalition, there's three parties in the coalition and one of them decides, you know what, we're bailing ship and this other party comes in and now there's a new configuration of three where two are the same but one is different. Does that mean the country's fallen apart or no, it just kind of means there's been a small power shift in the government. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and even that is not, is not that common. You know, Italy would be the example that you'd see that happening the most. Um, yeah. okay. uh, so Sabina, Sabina has this question about uh, is the traditional writing system up to its job? Should we have more MPs or MLAs? Um, I think that's largely a, a question that's independent of the question of PR. So um, PR systems can function, um, it, it really answers the question, how do we allocate the number of MLAs or MPs that we have? Uh, it'll work perfectly well with the uh, 87 that we currently have. It'll work perfectly well if we doubled that to, you know, 180. And uh, so I, I think that's, uh, uh, sometimes people have said, well, we can only move to PR if we keep all the existing writings and add top-up people. And so that means you know, we're, we're going to take our legislature from 87 to 150 and nobody wants more MLAs and so, so uh, PR is a bad idea. And I think it's really important to understand that uh, that's simply not true. Uh, we have good models that will even, if, if we want, will allow us to preserve every single existing riding <laughs> with one MLA per riding. We can do that if that's what the government, the other MLAs, the public wants. So we actually don't have to change very much at all in terms of the number of, of uh, MLAs, the number of ridings we have, the regional distribution. That's all separate from the question of uh, whether it's uh, better to have a larger number of MLAs or not. Right. So, I mean, that's a myth that I really didn't touch on because it hasn't come up lately in the media, this idea that PR means more MPs or MLAs, it absolutely doesn't. It just means that we're going to get a fair distribution mainly among the main parties that exist and that voters are going to help elect somebody. So somebody asked kind of the same question, how is every region guaranteed at least one representative? Let me be clear, it's not that some regions are going to be stuck with one, one representative. The, if there's eight, <laughs> here I go, Tony's like, ah, if there's, uh, if there's eight MPs right now in a region and there eight of them are elected with first past the post the difference is going to be they're going to be elected differently but you're probably still going to have eight you know in one way or another you're still going to have eight whether they're elected in a multi-member district whether some of them are local and some of them are regional 
nobody's going to lose any strength. Really, you're, as a voter, you're going to have more representation and more choice. Um, somebody wrote me in. I want to make sure I get this. And I think there were two people that emailed me questions, and I've lost the other one. So if you're the person that I lost your question, <laughs> please write it in the chat box. Um, this person wants to know. It's kind of a broad question. All the political parties plan their campaign strategies based on the existing set of rules and they count on a certain balance in the system. Proportional representation changes the rules and injects uncertainty. How can each party's fortunes be affected by the introduction of proportional representation? Sure. Uh, so actually I want to tie this uh, to another question that uh, Paul Beckwith wrote, which says, does PR reduce the power of corporate lobbyists and does it protect democracy from fake news and propaganda? Um, so I, I think the certainly incentives change, but one of the things that happens, I, I think probably the, the biggest single thing that changes is that you can't capture government through capturing uh, a premier alone. So we know that in our current voting system, um, Canada has evolved to concentrate more and more power in the office of the, of the uh, governing party leader, whether it's the premier or the prime minister. Um, and so we actually have a nearly unchecked system in comparison with the U.S., which has the you know the the um, more of a uh, balancing act between the various houses of Congress and, and uh, the courts and everything. So we are actually more liable to being captured by corporate interests by and, and on the right, of course, people worry about the government being captured by union interests. Um, what happens with PR is that the, the natural representatives of each of those uh, lobbying groups in, in society uh, Th those those representative groups are smaller and so they don't have monopoly power over the legislature anymore and so that means that you actually if you're going to try to um, give a freebie to one of your supporters and you're you know one of the minority one of the minority part partners in a coalition uh, you actually have to convince people who have no who are not directly beholden to that same lobbyist and so you actually put those issues out in the public, you have them discussed, and uh, if, if the other partners in a coalition are not going to see big public benefits, and they're not going to be getting any of the kickbacks from this, then that kind of favor does not actually happen. So what you tend to end up with, um, and this is well established in research, is uh, policies that actually align much more closely with that of the median voter, you end up with policies that are supported by a true majority of the population, and those policies tend to be much more stable over the transitions from one government to the next. Right. So, I mean, sometimes people are asking, um, you know, why is the, you know, the corporate right, why do they care about the voting system? And there's some research to show what Tony's saying, that it's when there's a single party right-wing government in power. All, if you want to get your the legislation written the way you want it, you only have to convince that one party. It's a little harder to convince three different parties mm -hmm. to take what you've written and uh, just implement it, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, somebody isn't understanding here what I'm saying about regional thresholds. So they, they want to know why we can't just have a national thing where any party nationally gets 5%, they get representatives. They don't understand um, how the proportionality is always, is is going to be within a region most likely. Okay. Yeah, so I think that stems from uh, two different uh, uh, issues. One is if we're talking about Canada federally as opposed to BC, which is, the, you know, the current campaign, um, at, at the federal level, um, our constitution has some provisions that relate to uh, preserving the number of MPs elected from each province. And there is a case to be made that the way that the law is phrased, um, that, the, that votes from outside the province can't elect or affect the election of representatives in another province. So 
uh, basically that that means that most people who are proposing models for Canada uh, accept that as a given that the that the distribution of MPs between provinces is set by the Constitution with uh, appropriate amending formula for for accommodating population shifts but uh, that any PR model uh, should basically operate at the level of the province or smaller um, so that's just a uh, uh, I mean, in, in principle, I, I suppose that could change, but um, th there's there's no really strong motivation to do that. And so the second, and, and it's because of the second issue, which really is um, the, uh, uh, a societal reality in Canada, which is that we have a very different geography than a country like the Netherlands or Belgium or um, Switzerland or, or any of these places that are kind of geographically compact. And uh, we have a, a much different distribution of urban and, and uh, rural and, and, you know, really rural <laughs> uh, places. And uh, so, I mean, we can, we can look back to the um, 2007 Ontario referendum um, where there was uh, proposed a closed list province-wide. And one of the most effective lines of attack was this means that all the top-up MPPs are going to come from the Toronto area, and so we're going to lose, you know, a third or more of the uh, MPPs from northwestern Ontario. And so, by and large, uh, I think electoral reform activists have taken it as a presumption that the more rural regions in Canada would like some guarantee that the number of MLAs, MPPs, MPs um, are going to be unchanged under the voting system, and we have through you know, many, many hours of <laughs> heated debate, uh, realize that there are excellent models that we can all support uh, that satisfy this constraint and nobody has any concern about um, trying to go to anything that uh, requires us to have province-wide anything in anything but the smallest provinces. Right, and that does mean, you know, to answer the question that uh, more, a little bit more, that does mean that the models for Canada aren't as proportional as something you might see in, you know, the Netherlands, okay, <laughs> right, where they have 13 parties. They can be, with the parties we have now, yeah, they can be, the results can be, but if we were to get more and more parties, um, you know, if there's only eight seats in a region, you need a certain percentage of the vote to get one of those seats. And most people look at that as one of the trade-offs of getting proportional representation while having Canadian geography. Mm -hmm. Although I, I, I should add that there, there is, um, it, it, you know, it's an increasingly subtle point and we may not want to go there today, but there, there's a distinction between um, uh, overall proportionality, which, you know, matching the, uh, making sure that as many voters as possible contribute to the election of candidates and so, so that the outcome uh, has has fully taken that into account, and the the so-called threshold, the smallest size of you know uh, the smallest vote share that could lead to the election of somebody from a particular party, and it is actually possible to play with those a fair bit. But if if you go back to what uh, one of the things Anita was saying, she was talking about um, the the critique about uh, how PR can lead to extremists. Uh, candidates and parties being elected. And I mean, it, it, I, th I think what you said, Anita, was perfectly reasonable and, and uh, everything, everything you said is true. But if collectively we want to design a system that prevents very small parties from getting in, then there is actually, there are mechanisms in, by setting these regional sizes that, that will put in place an effective threshold that will stop super small parties from emerging, but still allowing us to capture, you know, the second preferences of the voters who supported them. So It's a balance. You know, you can't yeah. have it both ways, right? People that support proportional representation, you know, see, oh, look, you know, there might be a, you know, a 7 or 8 or 10 percent threshold to get a seat in a region. That's not fair because they're thinking of the Green Party, right? And then on the other hand, the next question they're asking is how do we stop the extremist parties from getting seats? 
you can't when they've got seven percent of the vote <laughs> you can't have it both ways it's a balance so none of us have the perfect balance that's going to give everybody the outcome they want when people want different outcomes okay all we can do is look at the examples that I gave you right which is like Germany New Zealand Scotland and say how many parties do they have what kind of systems do they have what kind of outcomes are they getting and this is a, a safe highly proportional balanced set of choices that we have here right it's yeah, yeah. you can't meet every objective at once but we can do 1,000 times better than we're doing right now I guess yeah. that's yeah um, somebody else is saying, what's the best argument about safe seats in PR? Yeah, the, so the best argument to make um, that, well, I, I mean, I think the, if you're trying to critique first past the post, um, I think what you do is, is you, you find people who are really frustrated by the fact that no matter how out of touch your local <laughs> MLA or MP is getting, you know, you can't unelect them and, and your vote is, is ineffective. Um, I, I guess uh, the question is, is really does PR eliminate safe seats? Um, if, that's the, if that's the case, I think you, you can easily make the case that uh, particularly the candidate focused uh, systems, the ones where you have ranked ballots and you're, you have an option to choose between uh, multiple candidates from the same party, um, that can eliminate safe seats. Uh, it means that every uh, to, to be elected you actually have to attract effectively a seat's worth of votes um, from people who specifically support you. And if you are uh, an incumbent MLA or MP who is, uh, feels that they've been cruising, feels maybe that they've been um, sucking up a little more to the, the party leadership, uh, and you're not so confident in whether your constituents actually like you, uh, that could frighten you. So, um, yeah, I, 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 of course, um, <laughs> I, I think most voters, and, and certainly most, voter, most uh, members of the BC Citizens Assembly, thought that this was a value that would be populist and well-supported, um, even if some people in parties didn't particularly like it. On the other hand, um, you know, we do have to think about the, the, the interests of the sitting MLAs. And if MLAs are responsible and responsive and doing their job, uh, then under these voting systems, well, under our current voting system, especially if they're in one of the marginal seats, they're liable to being kicked out, even though they're the top choice of the people who are supporting them. So a very small shift in votes, uh, mainly votes by people who are not their, their primary supporters can kick them out of a job even though they are the top choice of the people who support them. And so under some forms of PR, their job would be very, very secure if they were responsible and responsive to the people who support them. Right. So, I mean, Tony's kind of saying, you know, if we look at the last federal election, we saw the, the red wave, right? So we saw the red wave, uh, the Liberals picked up 32 out of 32 seats in Atlanta, Canada. There's like no other voice in Atlanta, Canada other than Liberals right now, okay? And competent, good MPs that had good, strong support, you know, like Megan Leslie, were out with the red wave, okay? We won't see that with PR, okay? We'll see voters even when a party kind of falls out of favor and gets less seats the strongest MPs from that party are likely going to survive the change of government because it just gives voters a more nuanced uh, kind of tool to look at the other thing with safe seats is in BC I didn't realize this until like, yesterday uh, 60 68 percent of the seats in BC are safe seats try to Get your head around that, 68%. So just to be blunt, okay, if you're a voter that lives in one of those 68% of safe seats, the parties don't care about you, okay? Maybe they'll call me up now and say, we do, we do, okay? But really, <laughs> when, when you look at where are they campaigning, where are they cutting checks, where are they kissing babies, where's the tour bus going, it's not to your riding, okay? Because it's already a given who's going to win that riding. And so the entire election becomes focused on a handful of voters 
in swing seats, okay? So, and the other thing to look at is this idea of safe seats and strategic voting. Proportional representation doesn't eliminate them, but it greatly, greatly reduces them, like at a game changer kind of level. That, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody else is asking about, uh, is it useful to look at what's happening in the U.S.? Like, is that helpful to our campaign to be able to point to Donald Trump, basically? I think that's what I'm getting out of these questions. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I, yeah, I think so. So many of you will have seen um, Bill Thielman's uh, recent article in the TIE, and, and if you haven't, I recommend reading it, not because it's correct, but because uh, it shows you how we are going to be attacked. Uh, but he talks about how PR will um, enable extremists to be elected, and he goes through a couple of examples in other in other places. Uh, Anita really referred to them, um, Sweden and the Netherlands, and yes, indeed, uh, and, and Germany, indeed, uh, far right parties did win a few seats in in those elections. But if you look at what happened after the election essentially the major parties refused to do a deal with them. Um, uh, by and large, they just, uh, they just ignore them. And uh, so that's, uh, that, that's really what happens. Otherwise, as Anita said, um, you know, we, we shouldn't imagine that these people are not existing in our current parties. And, you know, depending on your political persuasion. I mean, uh, there are, uh, at, at the federal level, we saw um, the Conservative Party had a leadership race in which at least uh, two of the candidates were considered to be fairly extreme in their views. And under our current voting system, they could potentially have taken control of a major party that could have won uh, full control of government on, you know, 36, 37 percent of the vote. And uh, so, um, I, I recently put up a, a, a post, uh, a little note from Fair Voting BC, and I, I, I said basically, first past the post equals Trump. I mean, we shouldn't kid ourselves that racists and extremists are not among us in existing parties. And uh, so I think, yeah, using, using the US example that uh, under first past the post, they were actually able to elect a leader under a wrong winner election, in fact. Um, you you can get quite extreme people coming through to have essentially unlimited power. So I, I think that's a pretty good rebuttal at the moment. I think you know it's all about how decisions are made again. And if you look at that power power pyramid I showed, where in the end it all boiled down to the one person and the nameless people, that's what happens with first past the post that wouldn't happen in a proportional system. Um, yeah. And I mean, before this webinar, I was actually kind of going through the 30 OECD countries uh, that I listed in that pie chart about coalitions and supply and confidence agreements, trying to find countries where the right-wing populist party was actually part of the government. And it was, I only got like two-thirds through the list, but I only found two. And uh, like countries like Finland, <laughs> where there's a right-wing party that has 19% of the vote, which is one of three parties in a coalition government, which is center-right. I don't think Finland's ready to explode or make the world news anytime soon, and 19% of the vote is not a fringe. So, I mean, these views exist, it's just where are they, how are they organized, and it gives all parties an option about who they want to work with. Yeah, and actually I did want to add that, uh, that I've read a, some papers that have um, argued, to my mind, fairly convincingly that there is zero relationship between the development of these perspectives and representation in Parliament. So uh, what we see generally is that regardless of the voting system, um, the, the number of ballots cast for these parties is, is fairly similar. Uh, and so it, it's not that the voting system, as Bill Thielman suggests, it's not that the voting system shifting to PR will encourage the emergence of these extremist parties. Right. These, these people are there. Fortunately, in Canada, they represent a very small fraction of voters. They may represent larger fractions in some other countries, 
but their emergence was not due to the voting system. Okay, so we've got a few questions now from people who are wanting to know, um, okay, there's a few different ones. How can I help in BC? How can we get the word out in BC? What if I don't live in BC? How can I help? Uh, and a related question, which I forgot to ask earlier, so I'm going to ask it now. Um, people wanting to know if this is all baloney, what we've been told, why isn't the mainstream media out there telling people the truth? Oh boy, um, <laughs> read Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess in, I mean, I, the answer to the last part of the question, why isn't the media doing its job? Um, I mean, the media is by and large uh, corporate media and uh, they are fairly fully invested in, um, in the self-interests of corporate Canada. Uh, so there are occasional voices that they allow. Andrew Coyne is a good example. Um, but by and large, uh, what you find are uh, journal, well, I hesitate to call them journalists, um, pundits, uh, columnists like uh, Mike Smith, um, uh, Les Lane and, and others who simply tell what are essentially untruths or exaggerations or um, wild speculation. And, uh, and for whatever reason, they're rewarded for that and not for reporting truthfully. And so that's actually a major fact on the ground for us. We have to deal with the fact that um, we have a relatively unfriendly media environment here in BC. Um, and we have to find ways around that. We have to find ways to speak around the media. Uh, and it's not a matter of ignorance for these people. Again, as I said before, it's, it's not a matter of ignorance for uh, the liberal leadership candidates. Um, they know that things are different. Uh, and they are willfully misleading people because it's in their interest to do so. So, um, yeah. in terms of, so there, you know, there are, there are a number of publications often there, um, you know, so, so one of the challenges we certainly have in BC, um, is that the electoral reform movement is, uh, seen as a, a progressive cause or a left-wing cause, uh, it's a little ironic, actually, because Fair Voting BC has its origins in the political right. It, it, it actually arose out of um, uh, disgust and distress at the fact that Gordon Campbell's Liberal Party um, lost the 1996 election despite having won more of the popular vote, and the NDP was returned to a, a majority government with um, less of the popular vote than the Liberals had. Uh, and so it was actually a bunch of people on the political right who said that this can't be allowed to continue. We must have we must have fair voting. Um, so it's it's very interesting to see in the twenty years since uh, how how there's uh, been that significant shift in perspective. Um, to my mind, it's still uh, fair voting. BC is an avowedly nonpartisan group. Um, we still think that liberals should be represented on Vancouver Island. Liberal supporters. We think NDP supporters should be represented in the Okanagan. Um, but uh, the the struggle this time round is being um, made much more partisan by primarily by the actions of uh, liberal leadership candidates and liberal MLAs, and we have to find ways of defending liberal supporters across the province and all the others who want to see a fair voting system. Um, so, in terms of how to uh, how to help here. Uh, we are um, working actively. We are creating an electoral reform alliance that's bringing together um, many, many groups to, to fight this fight. Um, so probably almost any uh, uh, civil, uh, civic society focused NGO operating in BC that any of you belong to uh, will be getting very heavily involved in this. And one of the most important things you can do is work with the organizations that you are already uh, part of and, and involved in. Tell them to take a stance on proportional representation. Tell them to endorse it. Uh, seek to figure out how uh, they can play a role in all of this. 
Um, if you want to play a role more directly, it looks as if the two organizations that are going to be doing the most to activate, um, uh, <laughs> quite hesitate to call everybody ordinary British Columbians. What I mean is uh, British Columbians who are not uh, directly affiliated with a political party or one of the, you know, or with a union or with one of these other groups um, would be Leave Now and Fair Vote Canada's BC committee. And uh, they're doing the grunt work of organizing teams on the ground. So uh, I, I'm sure Anita can give you all the details about how to get plugged in there. There will be lots and lots of things to do. Uh, everything, I mean, a, a huge part of what we have to do is identify our supporters and help those people realize the importance of filling out the ballot. Uh, that's the number one thing I think we have to do. And then we have to do the other work, the hard work, of convincing people who you know don't already believe that and uh, but mobilizing the people identifying and mobilizing the people who do and then trying to convince some people who don't yeah and i mean i would say that the opponents certainly have the for the most part they have the media the mainstream media um mm -hmm. and they have the money uh but we what we have is the people <laughs> mm. so I mean, the flip side of the idea that most people aren't politically engaged is that when there, when there are a few people in a community who are politically engaged and are out there making a lot of noise about it, those voices get heard. Uh, mm. People pay attention, you know, when the local newspaper wants to talk to the yes side, is there a local yes side? If it's not on our website, then help us start one. Um, yeah. You know, so we have an extremely active letter writing group right now that responds to all the um, misinformation put out by the liberal MLAs and the local media outlets in BC. Um, so you can join that. Um, you can start a local team. You can join your local team that already exists. So we have the capacity to reach a lot of people, um, but we're going to need to grow a lot and we're going to need to use it to yeah. counter the, the other side. Can I add a couple of other quick things? So one is if you are, um, so, so one of the accusations that we're trying to deal with is that this is going to hurt rural British Columbia. Um, if you do live in rural British Columbia, uh, please identify yourself to Anita <laughs> and uh, let her know that you're there. Um, one of the strongest things we can, one of the most powerful things we can do is uh, bring local locally recognized people um, into the media spotlight if we can get people um, if we can identify people who are running rotary groups and you know uh, lions groups and all of all of these uh, counselors in uh, on local town councils if we can get people like that speaking positively about PR that can be immensely helpful and we also are going to need uh, donations <laughs> and we're going to need them. We need to uh, hire more campaign staff to really ramp this up. We're going to need to spend money on voter identification. Um, so we're going to need to do things like robocalling and Google AdWords and <laughs> all, all of these things. And all of that takes money. Um, we, need, we are going to need to roll out an advertising campaign and that takes a lot of money. So if you want to, start us off in the right direction. I'm sure Anita can, well, and Fair Voting BC will have a, a site up very shortly asking for this, but um, if you want to just start giving to Fair Vote Canada, Fair Voting BC, Lead Now, you know, we can, uh, we can start building up our, uh, our capacity to fight this campaign. I mean, in the, that actually is really important because if you look right now, the BC Liberals have paid advertising on Google against PR. So if you went the other day I Googled uh, NDP proportional representation BC and up came MLA Andrew Wilkinson's Google ad that said stop the NDP stealth plan. And it was all in it takes you to this petition that's full of reams of garbage against PR that we've talked about in this webinar, but people in his writing don't know that it's garbage and people that are Googling it don't know that most of these things aren't true. And they are starting early to saturate people with the idea that PR is bad because they know if they can convince people 12 months out, then it's going to be harder for us to change those minds later. So we need the money uh, now, not just a month before the referendum when there's only a slice of undecided voters left.
So yeah, money, staff, uh, that kind of thing. Gisela made a point here um, that Thielman was basically saying that um, PR would give the extremist people seats because uh, it gives them a platform to spread their views that they wouldn't otherwise have. And I, I guess I wanted to kind of address that because for one thing, they in first past the post, they already, they already have a platform to express their views. I mean, did anybody not see the coverage of Kelly Leach's leadership bid for the Conservative Party? The other candidates, I don't know if they existed because every day it was Leach and her, her Canadian values quiz or whatever it was, okay? Uh, so they already have a platform. And the flip side of that is that research is showing that in PR countries, it's not just the the people we don't want to hear from that have get attention, it's the people we do want to hear from who are now ignored that get attention. So one of the reasons why PR countries have been able to, for instance, make more sustainable progress on the environment um, and on tackling income inequality is because those smaller voices are there pushing the window the other way and getting heard and encouraging public debate. So again, we, you can't have it both ways. We, we, we let voices into the system and then we have a fuller public debate and then the public decides what they want to support. Um, okay, I, is there, what's the status of the referendum question in BC? Yeah, just really quickly, that's, uh, the government is running a process, a consultation process that we expect them to announce in the coming week or so. Uh, it will be an online portal, we're almost certain, um, that will be open through to the end of January. And so uh, groups that are, that are working together on this are actively discussing how we are going to um, uh, orchestrate submissions there actually one of the most important things we can do is uh, get lots and lots of responses in support of the main recommendations that key alliance members make because uh, the, the more that these recommendations come with support of, uh, of people across British Columbia, uh, the more likely it is that the government can um, adopt them and withstand any political attacks from, uh, from opponents. Correct. So, uh, you know, we're expecting that online consultation to start. When it starts, you'll be getting, if you're on our mailing list, and I hope you are, you'll be getting things in your inbox saying, um, you know, help us by making a submission, participate in this, and here's some key things to look at in what terms of what you're saying. The government needs to know that they are backed up on giving us a fair referendum process because the opponents are pushing hard in the other direction. They're pushing for supermajority thresholds. They're pushing for, you know, uh, just put one system that we find the easiest to defeat on the ballot and split everybody up and, you know, divide and conquer. And there's a lot of pressure coming one way and so we need to be putting a lot of pressure towards voter choice, towards 50% plus one, which is, by the way, what's in the BC Referendum Act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could I, could I ask, answer briefly? I, I saw a question from David Arthur about uh, the question of thresholds, and he's expressing some dismay about the idea that in some regions there could be a threshold as high as 11 or 12 percent, and uh, saying that it's not fair that um, you know the the remaining 10 percent of people don't have a representative elected. Um, I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, I think that we have mechanisms in all of the models that we have developed to set the thresholds at almost arbitrary values. Um, and it really depends on what, uh, uh, <laughs> what collectively emerges as the, as the preferences of the, uh, of the voters, of, of uh, people who weigh in on this question. Um, I, I think it's also possible using ranked ballots to make sure that even if um, we have a high higher effective threshold for a party to get somebody elected that the votes that were originally cast for that a candidate from that party can nonetheless be transferred to somebody else who is elected so that the, there is a, uh, th there are mechanisms for having as many votes as possible to count um, you know without uh, without going to the extremes that we see in some of these uh, other places so I hope that answers your question 
I would also say too, you know, in finding the balance, if you look at Fair Voting BC's website, they have a fabulous scorecard on there, which will help you nail down the fact that in BC, any of the models that are being proposed, which are all basically regionally based models, uh, allow about 95% or more of voters to elect, help elect an MLA from a party that they support. So, you know, you're really, you're not going to get much better than that. And a lot of it has to do with what the government hears from those voters. Those voters in the northern region, for example, where there's eight MLAs and they really do feel like that they're a regional community up there, if they want more proportional than eight seats, um, I, those voters will have to speak up and say to the government, we don't want a regional model, you know, but the counter to that they're going to get is, oh, you want a list MP from Vancouver? Do you know what I mean? So every everything's a balance. Every, whatever the government and people of BC want, it can be designed for them. We in the electoral reform community, after you know five referendums now, fifteen commissions, and all this kind of stuff, uh, have put together what we think are the most reasonable, highly proportional options that are designed for our geography. So, that, yeah, okay. Um, great. Okay, so I think that is it. And yes, per, yes, provincially, yes, the models can be uh, provincial. Again, that would mean that the instead of regional candidates with a mixed member system, that's what he, that's what this person's talking about. Instead of regional candidates, you would have province-wide MPs. If that's what people want, if that's what people tell the government that they want, province-wide MPs, if you're in the north, then, uh, th then the government will hear that. But we haven't heard that. We didn't hear it federally. We certainly didn't hear it in Ontario in 2007. Um, so, and that's actually some of the fear-mongering that the BC Liberal Party is doing right now, is that the MPs uh, won't be regionally located. Do you have anything else to add to that, Tony, or is that? No, no, I was, sorry, I was quickly scanning through some of the other questions. I know we're sort of at the end of the scheduled yeah. time, so I'm actually happy to stay on if anybody is <laughs> not so tired out that uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm right. to do but. I think this has been great. I mean, we've spent an hour and a half now uh, going through some information, talking about it. If you have other questions, you did things I said or Tony said you didn't understand, things that came up after you think are really important, please just get in touch with me. Uh, send me an email, same address as you got the invitation to attend the webinar. Uh, please do donate. Um, you know, if you can kick in 10 bucks a month, it's hugely helpful for us to know that we have that people have our backs and that we have, we can uh, count on that support ongoing. And the, another huge thing you can do, even if you don't have a penny to your name, is to, and you live in BC and you want to start a local team, just email me and I'll help you get started. You'll be very well supported. Yeah. Sorry, can I answer one quick question? I, I've noticed a few people um, uh, making comments about donating from outside BC and whether that's allowed or permitted. And uh, I do want to say there aren't um, in, in Canadian election law there are no restrictions on the activities of uh, um, nonprofit organizations that are not charitable and neither Fair Voting BC nor Fair Vote Canada are considered charitable because we do um, uh, political action. Uh, we have no restrictions until the campaign period and so we can accept money from <laughs> from all of you across Canada uh, from now until probably the end of next summer. Um, we just won't be able, and we can even accept money after that, we just can't use it. Uh, we have to be able to trace um, contributions uh, to, to our campaign expenditures. But uh, certainly now, this would be a perfectly fine time to give us money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's, a, there's nothing right now preventing you. You know, if you give money to Fair Vote Canada, we'll spend it where we need it. And right now, where we need it is supporting our growing teams in, in British Columbia. If mm -hmm. that, yeah. 
Okay, so thank you very much everyone for attending and we will be recording this and hopefully getting it up at some point in YouTube if you have friends that you think would benefit from seeing it. And we've had a, almost a full schedule of webinars this fall. Uh, we have two more system webinars coming up. We had one on STV and local PR in September. We have one coming up this month on mixed member and another one coming up on rural urban if you're into the technical end of it. If you're not, don't don't come because you'll be like, whoa. Okay, but if you're into really curious about how the mechanics work, uh, we have those. And send me what you would like to see in the winter in terms of webinars for our campaigners. All right, thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Bye.